welcome to tonight's event. I am Hannah Kate. I'm a presenter on North Manchester FM Community Radio and um, I'm delighted to be here tonight. I'm delighted to be here for, I think there's three reasons why. The first is that it's great to be back at the Festival of Libraries. Um, it's fantastic to see it into its second year um, of the festival, which is really great. The second reason I'm delighted is to be in Eccles Library because it is just such a fantastic space. But the third and biggest reason I'm delighted is because I'm in conversation with our guest tonight, Mike Sweeney, who is, um, well, I think we're gonna cover probably some of this. Um, broadcaster, musician, um, and now telly as well. Um, and Salfordian, I think that's, that's probably the bit I should have said first, isn't it? Um, Salfordian through and through. Um, born in Salford in, do you want me to say the day? Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. No, in oh. <laughs> 1947, um, to Irish Catholic family, um, left school at 15, did some real jobs. <laughs> um, I worked for, um, my mum said, what do you want to do, R. Michael, when you leave? This is like December 1962, and um, I said, I'd like to actually uh, be in a band, and my mum said, excellent, I've got you a job as an engineer and apprentice. <laughs> So I said, oh, I, I don't really want to do that. She said, well, that's great, but you're starting on, what, the 4th of January. My mum had, had sorted the job out in Trafford Park with a company called Amalgamated Engineering Industries, which used to be Metropolitan Vickers, who made, they made the, uh, the Avro Manchester for uh, the Second World War. So did that, worst engineering apprentice ever. Honestly, I was, I was engineering what Graham Norton is to spot welding. It was like, hated it. So did that, worked on a coal mine then for a few years. Quite like that, actually. Um, hard work, but by that time, coal miners, you were on good money, proper. Hardest job I've ever done physically, but the money was good. Uh, got fed up of doing mor mornings. So I was getting up at four in the morning and then worked on the docks, which is where I work now, which is really bizarre. <laughs> so I did about three years, two or three years then. And then after that, from then on in, through the rest of my life, I was either in a band full time, making enough to earn a living, or I was in a band and doing a day job. And I found the best way of being in a band and doing a day job was to either drive something, so sort of band driver, once you leave the warehouse, it's, there's no mobile phones or sat nav. Nobody knew where you were till you got back. So we got to have a kip at dinner, you could do that. Uh, building sites were quite good because I could always find a way of, of getting off. You know, I'll go get the dinners, I'll do that. So I didn't actually do much work. Um, and then until 1980, when I got uh, asked to do a programme on Piccadilly Radio. So we, we should name check, should name check the band, um, the Sulphur Jets, shouldn't well, we? I was in the Sulphur Jets, but I was in a glam rock band called, well, we were first called, called Stack Waddy, like a, uh, almost a pre-punk blues band in a way, then a band called Smithy, glam rock band, before that was in a duo doing the cabaret clubs when you could work seven nights a week doing clubs uh, and we formed the Jets almost accidentally in 1977 and that, that, was, that, was an, that was an amazing time, that gave me my rock and roll dreams by the time we formed the band, I think just before, I was probably nearly on my 30th birthday when the band came together, so and I was doing what I wanted to do when I was 18. And just very quickly, it's the only swear word that you, I hope I'm okay with this, nobody's recording. Oh, you are recording, are you? Well, I, won't, I won't swear then. So Dave D from Dave D, Dozy, Beaky, Mick and Titch, those older, uh, those among you that are older know who he is, came and watched us at a club in Salford called the Condren Club. That was an absolute bloodbath of a great place. They were fighting, they were door and dragging people out to people just nutting people for no reason whatsoever <laughs> just because they liked them possibly so dave d kept watching we came off stage and he said i can't do accents but he said that's great i, li I like that i'm gonna sign you so we were talking sent out for champagne they didn't have any so they, they went somebody went to an off license in worsley worsley to get champagne when they brought it back i promise you he put a load of money they brought the champagne from worsley in a taxi and served it as, they didn't have wine glasses, so they served it as half pint glasses. <laughs> but this is, on a, I mean, it's not remotely exaggerated. And Dave says, Sweeney, how old are you? And I was, I said, I'm just, just turned 30, Dave. No, you're effing well not, mate. He said, you're 23. 
So I was 23 then for 10 years. I, honestly, I stopped being 23 when I was 41, I think. <laughs> so, uh, and that, that, that's the musical. So yeah, that, that Sulphur Jets gave me everything I ever wanted from a rock and roll band and got me my job on radio. So can I ask you then, um... Because we've sort of we've sort of segue quite nicely from the the introduction to the questions there, I think. How you get from being, what did you say, the world's worst engineering apprentice to being in the band? How did you how did you follow that? I was, I, in the January of 1963, it was uh, one of the, the two really dreadful winters of the last century. 1947 was one, and uh, 63 was the other. And for those of you, again, that are older, the third one was Mike and Bernie. That's <laughs> <laughs> all, thank I got. I don't, I don't often get, a, I don't often get, a, I don't get a laugh off that one. If it's a young audience, you think. No, sorry. So, um, and I was going to uh, the Dock Mission and they had a, like what would now be called disco, but it was like a record hop. So I left the Croft House where we were living um, on Regent Road, walked down past South Atlantic Club to Trafford Road. I can remember to this night, what I had on, I had a pair of what I now call skinnies, so um, draped white jeans, black t-shirt, medallion, donkey jacket, hard as nails, collar turned up, brilliant. And on my feet, I had a pair of wellies <laughs> to look like the lads on the waltzers. And, and to make them really sartorially, I turned the top down. I just, I just looked the business. Looked like steps, so actually, but anyway, so we and the weather it was dreadful. You know, what you like when you're young, you wear nothing, a t shirt, and just it's freezing. So I got there and it was sparsely occupied because the weather was so dreadful. And I went in, and the guy that was playing the records again, you know, not a DJ, it's just a guy playing records. And I said, Can you play his Shadows new single, which is called Foot Tapper? Because I was Shadows, Elvis, Billy Fury, Bobby V. Del Shannon, Gene Pitney, Joe Brown, Helen Shapiro, all that pre beatles stuff. I loved it. And I loved the Shads. Loved them. And he said, oh, I'll play it in a second. I said, I'll just play this. So I walked back across the floor to get a Coke and a packet of Chris. And I, halfway through the floor, he started this song. I just stood there and turned around. And even now, hair on my arm stands up. He played this song. And I thought, Jesus. He played it so two minutes, whatever it's 13 seconds, and I went, What was that? So I said, It's the new single by the Beatles. It's called Please Please Me. He said, it was just, It's just come out this week. And I'd seen Love Me, a new Love Me Do. They'd done People and Places on Granada TV. And it, it was obvious they were different. You know, they, they, they didn't have their hair won't comb back, and uh, they had those Pierre Cardin suits on. So they looked different. Don't get me wrong. And, but Love Me Do's Hey Baby with different words and a bit of mouth organ. This was a complete... The moment I heard that, I thought, I want to be in a band. I want to be in the Beatles. They never asked, obviously. Maybe we didn't have a phone, so they couldn't phone me up anyway. So I wanted to be in a rock and roll band. It took me from that moment till probably the very end of 1965 to get in a band. I had no money. Didn't know anybody in a band. Living in Oddsall, uh, couldn't sing, although some would say I still can't sing. And it, and it took me till 90, late 64 to meet lads in a band and eventually get my own band together. So that led to music. All through my life, I've always been told, if I can just give you, a, in a way, if, I, if I, I put a montage of my school reports, work reports from engineering trade school, could do better talks too much. <laughs> Everyone. So I was always told that, shut up. He talked too much. I remember somebody actually said to us in a car, going to De La Cell to do uh, my 11 plus, extra 11 plus. I passed my 11 plus. De La Cell didn't have enough places. So we had to go and do another 11 plus at De La Cell. And I, I was below the cut off line. So my going to grammar school and maybe at a uni, that was cut off on that day. And that was when I would be an engineer or a plumber or whatever. Not that there's anything wrong with that. And the woman driving the car, there's somebody, my mum had persuaded somebody whose son was going to give me a lift, and they had a car, a proper real car. And she had to and said, do you always talk too much? Will you shut up? And that was, no, but you know when you're told, shut it, 
you're common. And as I got older and probably louder, I didn't realise maybe for decades that me, it was my class. If I, if I was ever engaging with the system, the system was usually proper poshish. And they didn't like people like me, didn't like uppity working class people who put their hand up and said things and were a bit noisy and, and, and could maybe analyse stuff and had a vocabulary. It, they didn't like it. And I was constantly put down, sometimes subtly, <clears throat> sometimes I'd notice that I didn't get a, a chance at something. Sometimes it'd be really, really overt, shut it. Or, you'll never get anywhere, you son, you're too gobby. When I got in a band, it was the same. It was like, you know, you're always jumping about and shouting. And you can imagine the cum cumulative effect of that. So I just saw rock and roll as my salvation because I thought if I'm successful, eventually I can turn around and say, oh, I'll do one. Because if I'm successful, they're knackered because I'm successful. As it happened, I was. But through broadcasting, and not through rock and roll. Through not shutting up. Cause you, I'm you're... through not shutting up, yeah. But I want, can, I, can I pick up yeah. on the, the, what you said about having a vocabulary and, and not shutting up and being articulate as well, being working class and articulate? Because obviously we're here, we're here for Festival of Libraries, so it would be remiss not to mention a library and your experiences of libraries when you were younger, because I'm interested to know about how you... Um, I know you said gobby, I would say articulate. <laughs> um, I and, and I quite a loud, you know, a loud voice and, a, and an accent. But if, if, you, if you, I remember very quickly, and we'll go back, it's about, put me back where I am. I'm in the mine, going down the mine shaft with the mine manager, 1968, and I did ventilation. So I'm stand there, He's got, he has a different app than me, different lamp than me, different everything than me. We stood in the mine shaft in the, the cage going down the shaft. I stood there and he's got a, oh, he had a, a, like a staff that my managers had, my manager's staff. Don't know why, he's not gonna fall over. So he tapped the toe of my boot. And I said, what have you done that for? Which I think really pissed him off. And he said, just checking you've got steel toe caps. I said, they're my boots. I, I bought the, because they weren't issue boots. So I bought these, especially I like them, I don't like the issue boots. I said, Do you, did you honestly think that I'd get in a cage with the mine manager with a pair of ordinary boots on? And he said, well, no, I said, well, no. Anyway, I don't know, the conversation, it takes a while to go down, the conversation, for some reason, got onto a book, I've no idea why, I might have said, and he said, oh, um, have you read such a thing? I said, no, I said, it's, I find it a bit insipid. And he said to me, do you know what insipid means? And I said, do you know what patronisation means? <laughs> he couldn't, couldn't believe that a sulfur accent was insipid, you see, I think it's a bit, because I was a bit like that. Okay, so back to where, where you are. That, so you know. libraries then, um, since we're at the Festival of Libraries, were they a part of this then? Li libraries, I've got two, three oases in my life. One of them was Sulf regional swimming baths, because I could go there for free. And I used to go on my own and swim up and down and dive and brains going all the time. I used to love sitting there and I'd make things up and tell myself stories and stuff. And I found it really sophorific. You'd go there in the winter. It's only me in two people. It's cold. The baths were all dead hot, full of steam. And you could sort of sit. And they had a big, like a plunge bath. They don't anymore. And I'd sit in there sometimes just putting the world that writes in my head. So there was that. There was rock and roll. And I went to Regent Road Library. I can't ever remember not reading comics, books, anything, everything. And Regent Road Library. Can you imagine this writ large? With all due to, this is like a really nice prefabricated shed compared to Regent Road <laughs> Library, which was, you only talk like that, ever. Wood panelling, Victorian, stunning. Even with high, I'm sure it was stunningly beautiful. And they had reading rooms. So I used to go in the kids' bit, and you could sit in a chair, relatively comfortable chair, and read all day if you wanted. And I could read a book in a day. If I went in there early doors, I was I used to read. I could read the book, then I'd take two home with me. And I read every science fiction book. 
and I, read, I ran out of them eventually. And my mum took me to the library and said, my son Michael has read all the science fiction books. Would it be possible to, to read just science fiction books from the adult library? So she spoke to the head librarian, they came back, they gave me a special little ticket that allowed me, and I discovered Isaac Asimov and Philip Dick and, and John Wyndham. And I was reading stuff at 11, 12, 13, with words in, and I got them straight. I knew because of the context. So if there was a word, you say there was the word, let's pick a word out of nowhere, somnambulant in a book. <laughs> if, I, if it was in the sentence, I instinctively knew what it was. And that library, in the winter it was warm, and we lived in a little council flat that was freezing, and there was five kids, my mum and dad, and no privacy, no room. I would go and sit in the library all day if I needed. In the summer, it was lovely and cool. And although I'm loud, I love peace and quiet. And when I'm reading, I'm, I'm in another world. I remember once, a few years ago, I smashed my nose open with the tailgate of the car. I do that quite a lot. Just smash my nose open, there we are. <laughs> Went to the back door of our house, said to Viv, Viv, I said, can you get, get us a tissue? I said, and will you get me Lord of the Rings? She said, well, I said, I'm going to the hospital now, I'll get this sewn up. <laughs> and I knew I could be there four or five hours. I thought, if I've got Lord of the Rings, which I've read, and I can, see, cause I can read it because I know how it ends. I can, I can dip into it, but it doesn't matter. There's no way that's going to run out. And if yeah. I've got something to read, my whole life has given me a world. And the library, that Regent Road library, oh, Jesus, it was an oasis. And uh, I remember being at school and the, the book that we were reading was The 39 Steps by John Buchan. And all, all of my schoolmates thought it was shit, if you'll pardon my answer. They just did. Oh, and I, I loved it. I loved this. I loved James Hannay escaping and getting off out the, the train on the fourth road bridge and escaping across the moors and being chased by an aeroplane. And you could feel it. It was there. So did, did you did you feel a pressure to because you know growing up as a, a working class kid in in Salford or in Manchester or probably anywhere there can be a lot of pressure <coughs> not to be articulate not to be into reading not to like libraries did you ever feel that you had to hide that side of you right it's really counterintuitive I got bullied at school for only for about a year and a bit at the time it felt as if I'd been bullied my whole life. And there were reasons for it. I'd, I'd got in a, I fell, when at Salford Lads Club to have a wrist worth 13, nearly 13, I fell down a cliff, smashed my face in, so all my teeth were broke. And so for a couple of years, I thought it was really ugly. Um, really had low self esteem about my appearance. Um, and my lip was permanently thick. And there's a whole story about getting that sorted out. And I didn't have that confidence that I maybe had had before the accident. Kids pick up on that. Bullying wasn't always physical, It was a lot of it was psychological. And I didn't have the, the, an interface with these people to think I didn't have to be articulate. I, went, I walked away from that or ran away from that to my oases. They didn't even know. Some of them were too thick to know. Don't mean they didn't have a... They just weren't, they weren't interested, you know what I mean? And... When I decided at 16 that nobody was ever going to bully me again, ever, and I set out to get everybody back, which isn't not in any way saying that violence solves anything. It's certainly not something the BBC would condone. However, I battered everybody. And did it help? Yes. <laughs> you battered bat your bullies? Or does anybody... Bullies. <laughs> All of them. Did it help? Yes. Is it good? No. Sorry. Is, did it cure it? No. I only realised how much it had formed my life when I started working for the BBC and I started talking about subjects I wouldn't have spoke about. So I only realised in this last seven or eight years how that had formed me and it explained how I sometimes work within society with other bullies. So my whole life's been confrontational with anybody that wants to confront me. So if you want to fight me, this is going back, I'll fight you. Let's let's have it now. Or I wouldn't. You'd say, oh, I fancy fighting you, and I'd hit you while you were talking. Because I didn't want to get bullied again, ever. But once it was like that, and people thought it was tough, nobody would have dared say to me, 
you know, you think you're smart, you. Because they didn't they won't have had the courage to have done it. And I met a load of lads who were bright, that were in bands, who now, when I look at it, I wouldn't have thought of that, were from middle class backgrounds, the dad's own firms and stuff. But they were just like me, I thought, but they weren't actually looking at it. And they were all intelligent and articulate and literate. And so I was with them anyway, do you know what I mean? I have found at times people have, again, pat, I say pat, I know, looked at me like as if it was a, a dog that could sing. Not a great singer, but wow, the dog sings. Whereas like, he, he, blimey, that scruffy bugger there, he's, he's quite smart. Yeah, but he's still scruffy bugger. Do you know what I mean, don't you? So, yeah, so the experience that you've had... was just, that was me. Do you, I mean, do you, how do you think we can encourage people to get that back? Because I'm not sure, there's a lot of people where you think they don't, appreciate libraries in the way that you know perhaps you're talking about how would you encourage people to find their their oasis in a library Jesus. today because there's so much competition no, for people's so, attention right i've got three kids all three mrs sweeney's unfortunately so three three people thought i was attractive um and i'm actually a serial People that thought you was attractive. Yeah, that's what I said. Three... Well, you met you, but no, found three people. No, three, three girls that actually found me reasonable looking. Um, but I'm a serial monogamist, so I was with Maggie. Oh, no, I wasn't. I married Maggie. God bless her. It was a disaster. I think we were married about an hour. And <laughs> she'd, she'd been pregnant with Dylan. Dylan's 52 now. Dylan's always read. But I used to read to Dylan and my, when he was a two, three, he's always read. Sh uh, Neve, my youngest, 22, and I've been with her mum now nearly 30 years. Neve's read, but Neve's mum read to her when she was a, ch a baby in arms. And eventually she got to like 10 months old. She used to read the same story all the time. Same story is. She had this book with like, had animals in it, but it had like fur. The animal would have fur in it. And she would get to the end of the page and Neve would turn the page because she knew from the cadence of the rhythm of what mum did that the words were on the next page. Siobhan, who's 32 and went to uni and got a master's, didn't read at all, apart from having to for study till she found Harry Potter. All right. And she's never stopped reading. So I don't know. I think it's, it's a bespoke situation. To, what you've got to try and explain to someone that's young is that if you can read, you don't have to, if you can read and you like reading and that you can read and you understand, that knowledge will insulate you pretty much all the way through life. Because if you've got that knowledge, if you've got those words, if you can articulate those words, I would never say don't, you don't have to pass exam, but you don't really. Those laws give you the knowledge to fill forms in, to talk to people, to get what you want, to, to not be fobbed off. You don't really have to do anything else, and it's getting that message across. I don't think there's one size fits all, I don't really. And I'm forever meeting people. Right? I'm, have you heard of Lem Cisse, the poet? Lem was in care, uh, and for Lem, it was a catastrophe. But Lem learned the power of words and the power of reading. But he went, he found it through his way. I think we've got to teach kids to read probably literally at four and five years of age. You've really got to get so it actually just be, even if it's a pain in the ass, it becomes part of the life, part of the part of the tapestry of what they do. Boring book. Well you read it and you get it. And then maybe it's not so boring. And then you read a book and you think, this is incredible. Was there, a, was there a particular book that got you really hooked on reading? You mentioned that you were, read, you were working your way through all the science fiction. Um, did you have a particular gateway into oh, that or gee, did you just love In it science fiction, which it, 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 it's almost a genre you have to take. There was a, a trilogy called, by a guy called Isaac Asimov. Foundation, second foundation, foundation trilogy. Which actually, when, when I look back, was quite complex and quite quite intellectual really didn't realize it because i liked it but i also like things i mentioned john windham who did um day of the triffids i loved i loved what is really an alternative universe 
Dave Triffids is where we live now, but the Triffids kill everybody or try to kill everybody. So I liked both types of sci-fi, like proper adventure sci-fi and quite intellectual sci-fi. But I suppose, I mentioned 39 Steps, I quite like adventure, but I read Just William, Billy Bunter, The Famous Five. So I read all these books about middle-class kids, Jennings. I loved it. Who had staff and maids and shit. And you're like, what? But I loved it. And I read Agatha Christie. I've read every single Agatha Christie book. And if you read them, she's anti-Semitic. She's racist. She's a snob. Her books are amazing. But read them. They're a snapshot of another universe. I love reading and thinking, Jesus, it was quite acceptable to make a comment like that in, in a book. That was okay. But then... I read about a book called The Ragged Trousers of Philanthropists by a guy called Robert Tressel. And that changed my philosophical and political outlook on life. So that's a standout. And then the next one then would be Lord of the Rings. I had no idea the book existed. I remember Led Zeppelin, one of their lyrics mentions Mordor, I think you want to... I had no idea what Mordor was. And I, I came across... I came across The Hobbit read The Hobbit, I thought, wow! And then read Lord of the Rings, but I bet I was 30-something, something like that, when I read Lord of the Rings. So those are like standout moments for me as, as you find your way through literature, you know? Has this, has this sort of fed into the music, the broadcasting, this, this love of reading and escaping and because you mentioned that rock and roll was another escape as well so i can see that they're sort of I, I, oh, where songs are concerned i started songwriting when i was probably nearly 30 and i wrote 40 or 50 songs for the jets i write bits now but i write once a year now less than that so and i wrote all my songs were written from a perspective of a, an 18 year old but i didn't have the, the i didn't have the the, the knowledge, the skill set at 18 to write songs. Couldn't play an instrument then properly. No, at all. Uh, and I wrote every song was about Salford, me, my life. Mm. I wrote some pastiches of American rock and roll songs, but mostly so, Gina, I've got a cartina. I think it was only me could write that line because my mate, Vinnie McCabe, his girlfriend was really pretty and she was called Tina. And it doesn't scan, Tina, so I turned it to Gina. But I'd always wanted a Mark II called Tina 1600D. It was like the dream. I was never going to get one because it's a snotty nose kid from Salford. So I wrote that, and who you're looking at, which is tongue in cheek, but is about fighting. It was about my physical struggle with life. And observations like, don't catch the last bus and uh, don't start trouble are about going out in Manchester when I was a kid. But things like She's Gonna Break Your Heart and my sort of eternal observation on, on being unlucky in love, you know. So I wrote and then I ran out. So let me just turn it, I think that might be turned on. I ran out of songs. I can write bits now. But I wrote everything I could write about being a kid. But the lyrical part of those came more from the heart than from the intellect. Yeah. Um, because there's nothing massively uh, wordy about Gina, I've got a Cortina, a new Cortina, a Mark II Cortina. But emotionally, it means a great deal, you know. Um, into broadcasting, the fact that I've got a great vo great vocabulary, and I know that, I'm not being false about this, that's absolutely served me well. Even in commercial radio, I, wor I worked in London for 10 years for Capital Radio with this accent. Not, I had less problems in London than I did when I first started in Manchester when the sort of Presbury elderly headset were absolutely crapping it because their kids were aping me. Kids were coming home from school talking like that. <laughs> no, 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 you live in elderly head, so no, we don't talk. <laughs> so, um, so that it, it's been, um, it's been for me, that's been my gift. The gift of write, the gift of reading has given me that. Yeah. Because I remember I'd be in London, you know, you, you, you you're quite smart, aren't you? And I go, I am actually, yeah. I can tell. And doing that, and in a way, in my own tiny way, saying, look at me, we're, we're, 
We're not all how you see the working class. We're not all on mobility scooters. We're not all obese. We're not all on benefits. We don't all smoke all the time. In fact, most of us don't. Most of us, regardless of what you do, whether you're working on the, as a lollipop man or a woman, or you're a plumber, or you're a window cleaner, or you work at Tesco, other stores are available. <laughs> regardless of that, I always feel that sometimes I can change perceptions. I mean, so, softly, softly, over 40 years, uh, and it's never been more useful being how I am in terms of conversation, interrogation, interview than it is now because the BBC. Literally, I've had them. First interview I ever did, I'd been there about three seconds and I was still sat in the studio trying to work out how to turn everything on because I'd only been doing one programme a week. Shit, right. Uh, Mike, 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 um, George Osborne's just done uh, uh, Breakfast TV. Okay. Um, you're interviewing him. And I could see him walking around. <laughs> um, we've not got a script. Can you, can you wing it? Uh, yeah, all right. So George Osborne comes in, give a proper robust... I mean, I hadn't been there long enough to challenge the way I would now. But I did a robust, knowledge, knowledgeable, intelligent, uh, I'd like to think quite erudite interview. And he left the studio. I thought, yes. And I looked there and I hadn't recorded it. <laughs> However, <laughs> I could do that with confidence. I've done it with la uh, the last uh, general election. I did all the, all the political leaders. I did... I did um, Boris, uh, Corbyn, oh, what's her name? Was liberal leader? That's that many. I forget. Oh, Joe Swanson. Joe. And, and I did Nigel Farage, who at the time was a player in, in that election. We forget now, but he was actually part of the part of the the, the, the infrastructure of that election. He, he was still doing major interviews and stuff. And I did them all. You know, when you go, not a problem. Sit down, let's go for it. Whoever. And I can do that with anybody. So you... You can put anyone in front of me, and you can put you can't you, you put Harry Styles in front of me on Monday. I said, "Hi, Harry, how are you doing, mate?" And I do that with it. I don't mean it like yeah, all right. I mean it's like hi, yeah, 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 everyone. So, Prime Minister, Papa, and all steps in between. But that's because I, I've read, and I still do. In our house, I've got Sunday Times. I'm on the last but one page. Because I read it from front to back and it takes me till, usually till Friday or Saturday to read it. And that's my outlook. I mean, I do read daily paper. I get all my political uh, news, uh, economic news, social news from that paper by reading it. So it, it holds me in great stead. Viv said, you know, and, and I do, I know a tiny bit about nearly everything. And I can bullshit. And has it that baffles brains sometimes. Having that that little bit of knowledge about everything um, helps as a broadcaster. Helps you to be able to do those interviews because it's forty two years, isn't it, that mm. you've been? Um, yeah. Can you tell just? Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw it open to questions from the audience at some point. I'm not going to hog mic myself all night, but um, did you? Am I right that you started off as a guest on? a guest on the radio and then you sort of got um, taken on on Piccadilly. I did, um, no, well, the Salford Jets became Piccadilly Radio's house band, basically. And we used to do a thing, we used to do their, they had the best disco in town. To do the, 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 you recorded some stuff for them. Yeah, but no, well, they played Walking on the Town Town, Looking at the Squares, in my first record, which I co-wrote with the band, and it's only got one line in it, Walking on the Town Town, Looking at the Squares, repeated, for two minutes, it's great. Walking down the town, town. Anyway, um, so I wrote one word, walking around. Anyway, <laughs> so we all, you know, the band wrote. So they played it. Yeah. Phil Sayer played it twice in one program and it changed out, changed the Salford Jets overnight. I was speaking on the radio and a million listeners. So we didn't have to be big nationally then, Piccadilly Radio. So when we released Manchester Boys, they played that and that was on Jukebox Jewelry and it's kind of a bit. When Gina came out, 
Piccadilly Radio had a North of England chart. We were number five in it. So constantly playing Soul for Jet stuff. And we started doing gigs for them. Quite prestigious. Um, and because we were about, let's say the jam were 1,500 quid then. Or madness. We were about 300 quid, which is good money for a band. But we could pull the same number of people as the jam. So we used Soul for Jet. So we used to use it. And we sort of became the house band. And we were doing the Willows Rugby Club in Salford, co-headlining with that other punk band, the Dooleys. <laughs> don't, don't, I, to this day, have no idea why. The, every other band was quite new wavy and punky. And the Dooleys, when, oh, it's, hot, it's heartbreaking. When we left the stage to go up to do the Duke of Welle, which we'd done every Monday, every, even, nearly all the audience left, about 300, 3,000 people, 2,700 went home. And it was, oh, it was, anyway, so we were doing this and this asked me to come in and do an interview about who you looking at, about this, this gig. And it was quite a long interview, like half an hour. And then they said, oh, will you do some promo? So I did this thing, oh, you know, whatever you do, like coming out the willows, see the Salford Jets and the dudes, blah, 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 you know, uh, blah, 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 blah. And a few little pithy comments and little quirky, what I thought were humorous cracks at the time, probably weren't. So guy that, ran the station was called Colin Sinjun Walters. The minute he got to Manchester, they said, Colin, drop the Sinjun, mate. <laughs> so he dropped, he did, he dropped it. We don't have, have a Sinjun, mate, in Manchester. So Colin Walters said to Tony Ingham, who I was with last Sunday, Tony, have a listen to this. And they listened, they said. It's because, he said, he's got a really unusual voice. Not just the accent, I've got no, Tony, my voice is, how it just you know what I mean? How it's a bit higher then, but the same yeah. delivery. I always sound as if I smoke a lot and I don't. I said, Have you heard how he did quirky? I said, What do you think? And Tony said, What do you mean? He said, Could we put him on the radio? And at the time, I promise there wasn't a single accent in the whole of radio, national, local, and commercial in the whole of the UK, apart from Fedu's Billy Butler who was on, but he was on BBC Radio Merseyside. So he wasn't really part of the, he was just in, in, in his own. And Tony Ingham came to watch the band a few times. And he thought, we'll take a flyer. When I look back, it's a bit like Van Targ saying, I've just seen this 16 year old kid playing for Salford City in the reserves. I'm going to put him up front for United, the first game against, Bre against Brentford. It was, it was, now when I look, do you understand the risk they took? And it was not successful. It was incredible. The reaction to that overnight in radio terms, that's how I got the job. And I only found out the exact mechanics of it last Sunday. I saw Tony last Sunday. And I mean, I, I can't, I can't exaggerate. It was overnight that, oh, good Jesus Christ, have you heard this guy? Kids, it was kids, kids just like, wow. Do you think it's because they could, for some kids, certainly in Salford, they could hear themselves? In, oh, yeah. Because well, that's always been They've never had anybody problem, that yeah. was real on the radio. Everybody talked like that. Even if, if they were from Salford, they all talk like that. And they have to do the smile and everything. And they're, all, they're all sort of introduced her. And the great song is the Eagles. And wow. They were like that. Because they were all club DJs transported onto the radio. You know, broadcasters now come from different backgrounds. All the DJs on radio initially were club DJs. So they were just doing club DJing on the radio. And Tony Blackburn, when I went to Capital Radio, actually said to somebody, just like, have you heard that Mike Sweeney? <laughs> he doesn't sound like a DJ, does he? And he said, I believe he's from the north. <laughs> yeah, right, Tony. Then they gave me his job. <laughs> so went down really well. So I think they just... It was, but then mums and dads liked me. Mm. It was really weird. Kids, it wasn't like being a Beatle for a few years. I mean, Jesus, I'd come, I'd come off air in school holidays. Once I was doing... I started every day, January the 3rd or 4th or something. And within days... I was inundated with mail, the station. Came off the air during the very first school holidays. I'd been on the air about three months, half term, and there were kids in Piccadilly Plaza waiting for me. 
Well, the radio station, we, 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 never seen or heard anything like it. I mean, it really was a bit like having a number, an overnight number one, you know. Um, well, on that note, I think we're going to turn to, um, not screaming fans, but certainly... Yeah. I've, I've made up how many's turned in. on. Do you know what I am? I, 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 don't, I didn't tell you, it was you was telling me. We did, um, I've, only, I've never done anything like this before. As I'm getting older, I've just been discovered, BBC particularly, want more diverse, socio-economically diverse people working. So they want people, voices like mine, and yours and faces like ours on the radio and they've just discovered they've got this guy who's 74 actually working for them who used to work down a coal mine and on the docks it's like jesus my daughter our siobhan who at the moment will be drunk in turkey said you're their working class show pony to, to which i said i don't mind so this sort of stuff and doing radio four i started to do bits of telly now it's happening because it's if they've only just we're if you watch there's so much out there that wouldn't have been out there four or five years ago about our class and our class is very important because we're not some homogenous we you can't take us off we we can sound as if we've just got released from strange ways i are you're all right or what it doesn't make any difference you can sound quite you can have an accent and it not be anywhere near as strong as mine, but we're all from that background where usually our mums and dads or grand grandparents were from poor backgrounds because there's not much inherited wealth. There's not many of us in the north of England whose great grandfather owned a mill. Do you know what I mean, don't you? And if you talk, I talk to people that have done so well and they'd say that they're working class actors and musicians and business people. Because, and suddenly they're discovering us and they're also realising that we pay the bills. We pay the bills. We pay the government's wages. And the, on, oh, sorry, we pay our politicians. They work for us. We don't work for them. The BBC, we don't work for the BBC. You and me, we pay my wages. And they're suddenly thinking, sugar, we need to address this. They, 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 they sort of, I think, maybe we were always pigeonholed in a certain way, working class had a certain image, like a stereotypical image that doesn't exist. Look at how different we all are, you know? And it's colorblind because if you're from a working background and your mum and dad or your grandparents came over on Windrush or came over from India or Pakistan, the same as us. You're still working to put food on the table, pay the bills. You're not posh, you know? Anyway, sorry. Because I love it. I, um, I've always worked though, my mum and dad. In those days, if you were a blue collar skilled worker, money was good. If you were a labourer, you probably earned half as much. My dad couldn't sell. My mum said couldn't sell. I think my dad had what we would now call really bad PTSD. He just, he drank all the time, come home from work, come in straight to the pub. When the working hour, working week was 46 hours, so it was five and a half days up to the 50s, he would go straight to the pub from work. And they used to literally throw him out at whatever it was, three o'clock, and he'd come home, uh, have a kip, have his tea and go to the pub. And I think, I think it, it messed him up. So we were always poor. And I was always aware that if you needed money, you, you had to work for it. There was no way it was coming in a gift or flipping, you know, nobody ever going to bequest anything to me. So that was there. I, just, I love what I'm doing. And I'm, I'm so fortunate, I'm scared, shitless of dying. Because um, I'm having such a good time. I family quite old, so I was 53 when Neve was born. And I've got the most, most wonderful family. I've, I'm, I married my, my soulmate, who is my other flipping, is like a spare pair of legs, arms and a brain with Viv. And we've been together like nearly 30 years now. And she's she was beautiful when I met her physically. She's, she's still... <laughs> let, him fin let him finish the sentence. I think he was she's about to... She's even more beautiful physically yeah, now. I knew there was going to be a good ending. absolutely... Ending. 
stunning. And I look at sometimes and think, I can't believe you're 62 and look like this. Jesus Christ. And so I walk. And when I go out, it's like I'm a girlfriend who's the best looking girl in school. Now, I'll walk out with her holding on and I think, have you seen my wife? So anyway, so all of that, that ethics there. But I do this for a living. I hope if I get crap at this, I'd stop. Um, I am aware of things like Alzheimer's and that, that might affect how my brain works. I'm aware of the fact that, you know, at my age now, I could get ambushed. I'm terrified. I'm forever having tests once a year for uh, PSA levels, for prostate, bowel tests, kidney. I do that all the time. I have my blood's done it every year. I do keep us fit, proper. I still play football and I still go running and I do weights and stuff. That's my little, you know, my pill. You know what I mean? That I keep alive forever pill. While I'm right, yeah, my family keep me young. I've got a 22-year-old daughter. Can you imagine I was sat in an armchair at home like that? <laughs> go away, Neve, I'm watching the telly. I can't, she wouldn't let me. She flipping, absolutely, you know. See, when Neve turned around, I said, do you know, Dad, you're cool, you. I feel like, I feel like a 40 year old thing, right? Fair enough. I'm right. Neve said I am. Jesus, I must be, you know. So that's long answer to a very simple question. No, right. It, you, honestly, you, no. so uh, and an author got, was writing uh, my biography and it was called Who Are You Looking At? And I've no idea why I know him really well. He's bottled it. He's, he, he's had like, no, I think, I think you might have issues and he, our writer's block or I don't think it's me or the story or the narrative. I think, I think he's got a difficulty with maybe even writing. Do you know what I mean? I'm not saying, or, or because he's, knows me, he's, he's known me for decades, maybe the physical proximity of me to him and, and our relationship, maybe. So he was writing that. I'm a bit lazy. I, I, I know. He's, I read Peter Hook's two books. They're amazing. He wrote them. Are you right? Vincent, you could write a book. Of course I could. Jesus, I'm lazy. Well, I thought based on your own experience, and you don't have to create characters. No, I know, but the stories are so deceiving. I think. I think because I'm working four day. I do four days now, and I'm doing more than ever. So I still do a gig. I do I try and do a gig a month with the band. I do this. I do that. I'm a. I'm, out, I'm up at six o'clock in the morning, get home sometimes at six o'clock at night. Um, it's, it would be finding the time. If I was retired, the answer would probably be yes. If I could sit there, do you know what I mean? But I'd like to dictate. I, I, I'd have to sit with Viv, who's a great type. She, she can do touch typing. That, I'm a bit lazy in that. I'm, in, in some areas, I really, I've got proper energy and commitment. I'm a bit lazy. I'm not saying there isn't one there. I think I would rather somebody wrote it because they would be more honest than I am. Because I would only write an autobiography. I don't, I don't think I've got the talent to write a great work of fiction. I don't, actually. Just like when I play football, I'm not bad, but I'm not a great footballer. I get away with it because I can do certain things. I can, I can tackle and, and track people and stuff. But I'm not a goal scorer, and maybe I just don't think I've got the the prerequisite talent to do it properly. But it's like, love you if you say so. And some no, so and sometimes I kick myself and say, "Come on!" But I don't. I'm not certain. But I, in some ways, I do lack. I still lack confidence in some areas of my life. Only little bits. I've got a '60s band because. I love the 60s, so I've got a 60s. It's like a review. I do theatres with it mostly, but I decided to go back to my roots this year. I've been doing working, what they used to call working men's clubs, so social clubs. So I've done three, and I've got another two or three to do. So I've done uh, Patrick Croft Con Club, I've done John Alka Club, I'm doing Chariton Reform Club, I'm doing Walkden Legion deliberately, and I do the theatre show there. Albeit, you know, th th there's no props and, and things and it's not, not got proper stage and stuff. And I do, we do two spots the way I would on a theatre. So I do that and I'll do, I did four, four or five theatres last year and this year. So I do 
very met and I do the plasma in Stockport with it. So, and that's my labour of love. That's me being Mike Sweeney, 18 years of age in a pop band, although I'm not. Uh, but the Joss Sulphur Jets do a gig a year. So we're doing the Apollo with Peter Hook at the end of July. So I do that. Um, and I do love doing the Jets once a year. I, don't, I didn't want the Jets to ever become a cabaret band. Yeah. So I didn't ever want to be doing a cabaret version of Who Are You Looking At? Um, so the band have got are all relative. Well, they've grown with me now, but they're all relatively young. They're all Scousers. Oh. I remember all my band of Scousers. I love it. All right, okay. Yeah, <laughs> and, and, and they came together through my MD is a sold for Jets fan going back to when he was 15, 16 and I found him by accident and he, he sort of, he puts the Jets, like gets the rehearsals and so on and makes sure that the Jets stuff has got the same spirit and angst to a certain extent as it had. Uh, back in the 70s and the 80s. Lots of lots of places people could see you then if they want to go around the work. Yeah, well, yeah, we we'll do. I mean, Chatterton Reform Club. I didn't know it, it was still open. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so, but that's that's in a way that's a, it's a little bit like I'm in chalk ice every now and then. You know what I mean? Um, and I do enough so it doesn't because it is quite demanding. Um, and I do enough so that you know, talk about work ethic. I, I've got to make sure that. I, I don't think I'm 74, that's the problem. I think I'm 40, maybe. And I've got to watch out that I don't push it so that I am a bit tired physically and mentally, you know what I mean, don't you? So, uh, But life that I'm living, I think, at time it was 50, you know, I think, at the moment. So. Yeah. Okay. So, just don't want to die anytime soon. But statistically, I could, like, even... Even tonight. And he died on the way home, yeah, he did. He was, he was very good. Or oh, not. He wasn't very good. God bless him, even though he's dead. I thought if I brought it back to the gigs and that, we could end on a, like, hi, but you've brought us back to death. Yeah. yeah. Like, uh, yeah but is that where we're ending? Is that we all end there. Yeah. yeah that's but, that's, uh, where we're... Um, but, you know, that's the last great mystery, though, isn't it? It might actually be an interesting journey. On that note... <laughs> The perfect way to, to end can, can I just thank you? It's um, it's for me doing this. I find out about me. It's quite cathartic doing this. Uh, I, I'm not talking me in a third person, but you are. You say because you're looking at yourself from there to then address the questions. Do you know what I mean? So you have to step out, and it's really interesting. Uh, and I also I think what it is sometimes when you do what I do for a living if I had to turn up tonight and there's one person here and that can happen you think see big Ed, you're not flipping you've not really made the impact you know you thought that you had but to see this turn oh I, I'm so chuffed I really am and that's where you write that the day that this doesn't chuff me or the day I do a gig and I don't care and I come off stage and I think I'm not doing an encore I just want to get in the car and go, I'll stop. You're right, I'll stop. Well, I think I speak for everyone when I say we're chuffed you were here as well. Um, and so can we give Mike a huge round of applause? It's been absolutely...